Invariably, we will use triangles to donate trusts, uh, rectangles to donate companies, and really just try to isolate that as a planning strategy on the way through to, to keep it very, very simple. With the idea being, and we'll see it with some of the slides in a moment, that a picture tells a thousand words. And if you can use pictures and symbols and diagrams to explore some of the issues, uh, certainly our experience is that invariably makes it a lot easier when you then get down into the document that runs to pages and pages long, actually analysing what that means in a practical sense. If we therefore have a really close look at the whiteboard here, I've said that there are really only ultimately four key principles that need to be in place in order for there to be a trust relationship in the first place. Now, I've already had a couple of questions come in here on the uh, discussion panel. Most of you will probably be able to ping in very, very quickly and say, well, hang on, there's a whole range of additional things that need to be satisfied. I would accept that feedback, but I would say that any other idea that you can come up with would be, I would argue, falling in under one of these four headings. So the first one is that you need to have someone with legal ownership. Invariably that's a trustee, invariably with a lot of the discretionary trusts that trustee will be a company. Its sole legal role is actually having the physical legal ownership of the underlying asset. Where is that underlying asset? Well it sits inside the trust but without an asset. Without an asset, there is no trust relationship. So it might, again, sound abundantly simple, but a really key point. And one that will be an interesting iteration when we start talking about, well, what happens when a trust actually vests, when you're looking at that underlying asset. So one is you've got a legal owner being the trustee. Two is that you've got some assets sitting inside a trust relationship or trust structure. Uh, number three is that you've got some rules. And invariably those rules will be set out in a trust deed, trust instrument, some sort of written document to actually articulate what those rules are. And number four is if it's not messing up the, the sound and audio guys too much. That you've actually got someone to benefit from the trust. So you've got some beneficiaries sitting down the bottom there of the structure to actually receive entitlements, whether they be income on the way through during the life of the trust and or capital uh, distributions, either interim or on the final vesting of the actual trust instrument. Within those four parameters, that's it. And the playing field is, is very, very wide in terms of what can and can't be done in relation to the trust structure.